keep coming after me. I don't know if you remember back at the very beginning of this whole COVID situation. Back in March, Kimberly preached, and she preached about Jesus as the Good Shepherd. And the image of leaving the 99 in order to pursue the one. It's a beautiful image that that song described. Friends, we've been moving through these Advent rhythms. Hope, peace, joy, love. And as we've kind of taken time to reflect each week, it's been my prayer that it would carve out space in you for you to meet with Jesus a little bit more personally, a little bit more intimately, that he would go to the very area of need inside of you and that you'd experience him. Because that's where hope, peace, joy, and love are sourced. They're sourced in Jesus. They're sourced in Christ. And so we've carved out this space and we're waiting. We're waiting because we're not always hopeful and we're not always peaceful and we don't always experience joy. Sometimes we're struggling in the darkness and where we desperately long for love, sometimes we feel loneliness. Sometimes we don't have what we need met. We're waiting. The Advent message is that while Jesus came, he's also coming again. And all of these longings in us that we have met in part now will be fully met one day. And so today, friends, we reflect on love. We reflect on love. Even in the waiting, we reflect on love. Now, the biblical message, why, even as it can be wrapped up in that song that we just listened to or the message of the, the Good Shepherd, the whole thing is one of God pursuing, God coming after us. And it's founded at the very beginning, at the very start of it. It's, uh, we see that it's founded on this idea of Trinitarian love, this idea of God. His life, his love, his interaction swirling. Perfect peace, perfect hope, joy, love, all swirling in harmony, in fellowship, in relationship. And it's out of this Trinitarian swirl, this life, this love, this passionate goodness that God chooses to create. Creating humanity in his image and likeness. And inviting each of us to participate in God's very life. All that swirls, that goodness, that life, that joy, that passion. And yet we know that we don't experience it all the time. Friends, we were created in and through and for love. We just were. That's the biblical message, is that we were created by God in his image to experience love. Because God is love. Now, when we think about love, lots can be said about love. And so often in church world, people actually say, oh, church is just, you know, you're just going to talk about love and it's just going to be sentimentality and mush. And yet love is anything but mush. True love anyways. But why we can say this? Well, let's see. You can go to Wikipedia and they describe love as this. Love is a variety of different feelings, states, and attitudes that range from interpersonal affection to pleasure. It can refer to an emotion of a strong attraction and personal attachment. Now, if that's what we're talking about, then sure, sentimentality. It's not bad. It just doesn't necessarily have the rootedness on which you can define all of yourself. And I gotta say, one of the most foundational verses in the Bible, right? John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever would believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And the next verse, that God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. 
Friends, the verse that gets held up at sporting events, that gets quoted by kids, that gets, uh, you know, that, that if anyone were to know a verse, oftentimes it's this verse. And this verse grounds this whole heartbeat of the biblical message. For God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. Friends, do we see in this simple verse that the incarnation is a lived love letter? That God put on flesh in order to show us love. Real love, not just sentimentality, but real love. The entire experience is distilled love. It's loving when Jesus went to the disciples as they were casting their nets in, as they were at their tax booth, as they were wherever they were. And he said, would you follow me? Right? It's love that he called them out of their life into his very story. It's love when Jesus met with those along the road, whether it be the woman at the well, whether it be lepers, whether it be religious leaders. And he showed love as he interacted in ways that burst bubbles of assumption and expectation and presumption. It was love when Jesus challenged the powers, calling them out on their garbage. It was love when Jesus got down on his knees and washed his disciples' feet. It was love when he went into the garden and his heart ached. It was love when he went arrested. When he was arrested and he went before Pilate. It was love when he responded in kindness, it was love when he went to the cross. It was love when he gave up his spirit. It was love when he died. Friends, and it was love when he came out of the tomb. It was love when he visited with, his, with the church. It was love when he visited with those early Christians. It was love when he ascended. It's love. Distilled experiences of love, not sentimentality. And as his disciples followed him watching all of this it was an example of what they were invited into from the very beginning now the religious leaders as they saw jesus as they heard jesus as they were wondering what's going on we know that they would question him they would ask questions of him and in one situation in matthew 22 they came and they said teacher which is the most important commandment in the law of moses Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Friends, the commandments are all wrapped up in this law of love. Love God with all of yourself and love your neighbor as yourself. But notice that it's not a command out of nowhere. It's actually a command rooted in an invitation to simply participate in reciprocal action. To respond simply based on how we've experienced God responding to us. Trinitarian love, life, fellowship, creation, inviting us to experience God. God coming after us wherever we are, and then saying, hey, how you've experienced me, show that to others. Reciprocal action. When we think about this task or this invitation to love like Jesus loved, there's a few things that kind of play. So this morning, as we reflect on it, the foundational invitation is would we embrace be being beloved of God and would we allow that to serve as a foundation through which we love other people? That we love God and love others. So the first thing, why, why do we do this? Well, friends, at the heart of this command is something called the Shema. So rooted within the Hebrew faith is this idea of loving God with all of ourselves. All of ourselves. Out of Deuteronomy 6, right? Heart, soul, mind. Everything you have from the bottom of the soles of your feet to the, 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 the hair that often sticks out of place. Sorry, Mark. 
we get to love. We get to love with all of ourselves from the furthest that we can reach down to the core of our being. We get to love. We get to love God with all of ourselves. And this invitation makes us wonder, what are we holding back from God? As we sit here today, as we reflect on Jesus coming, Jesus coming in a manger 2,000 years ago, and we respond to that, the love of God, we get to think, hey, what, what are we holding on to ourse for ourselves? What are we saying? Okay, God, I'll give you a little bit, but not all of myself. Well, part of it is that we see Jesus give his entire self for us, and so we get to, again, respond reciprocally. That loving God moves to loving others, love your neighbor as yourself. And what's so often glaring to us, I think now more than ever, is how different people may be. Even people may be sitting beside us here, they look at everything we're going through with different eyes, different sort of emphasis. And we sometimes even struggle being in the same room, right? We live at a time where people are polarized more than ever, and love becomes a little bit more difficult. It's easy to love those who think like you, act like you, sound like you, right? It's easy to love those who share every opinion under the sun. It's easy to love those that like that article you posted to Facebook. It's easy to love those who are just like you. And yet the call of Christ has always been from the very beginning to love those who are different. Who look different, who act different, who sound different. It's how Jesus responded, right? As we see Jesus' own life. But then as we see this message get filtered through the early church, Paul in Galatians 3, 26 to 28, he said, For you were all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. And here there's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Friends, from the beginning, the call of Christ has been to call to love across the boundaries that keep us separated. And in doing that, we tear them down. We tear them down. We truly do live in difficult times. And in response to those difficult times, friends, I want to invite you, and I want to issue a call out to churches all over, that now is the time for the church to be more radically the church than ever before. In more heartfelt love that tears down the walls that keep us separate, that tears down the walls that keep people uh, at arm's length from each other and keeps people lonely. We need a radical dose of Christ-like love in the church today. Martin Luther King Jr. said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. As we love like Jesus loved, we get to be a signpost to all who see us of what God is like as we go about loving God and as we go about loving each other. Now, I, I, I mentioned it, but another, another thing as we look to love like Jesus is that we see as he was nearing the end of his life in John chapter 13, we see this beautiful expression of love through the way that Jesus served his disciples. Jesus, the one who called them, the one who was the rabbi, the one who was the teacher, was the one who put on the towel and went around washing their feet. Jesus shows us how to love. And I got to tell you, that's not very sentimental, right? When you're down washing dirty, smelly feet, well, that's showing love. That's showing love. Friends, what would it look like if you embraced the invitation to love in this way? Where would you serve in new ways? Where would you love in ways that cause people to say, what? No, no, don't wash my feet. We say, hey, we're just following in the footsteps of our rabbi. 
Now, and again, when we look at loving like Jesus, what does that look like? Well, in 1 John 4, verse 10, this is real love, John says, not that we have, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. This is real love. A love not rooted in trying harder, right? A love not rooted in doing more. A love not rooted in just being more. A love that says, I am beloved. Period, end of story. And allowing our identity to get so wrapped up in that. Do do you see that? This is real love. Not that we loved God. It's not about our actions. It's not about our activity. It's not about us trying harder but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Friends, it starts, moves on, and ends in us simply embracing being loved. I got to tell you, when you're loved and you know that to the core of who you are, that there's nothing you can do to make God love you more, and there's nothing you can do to make God love you less, that it's out of that place that you simply live, that you get up each day knowing you are beloved. The way you see others also shifts. The eyes with which you interact with that person that cuts you off change. How you see other people will change when you know to the core of your being that you are loved. And that's the message, friends. That's what we see here. From the beginning, founded in Trinitarian love, All the way through the narrative, we see this narrative of God pursuing his people. All the way to Jesus coming in the flesh, born that first Christmas morn, showing us what it's like to really truly live life. Going to the cross for us, dying, resurrecting, and then sending a spirit and empowering the church to be the church. Friends, all of it is wrapped up in this. You are loved. And he keeps coming after us. Now, another way, when we think about loving like Jesus loved, it's fascinating to me that uh, Jesus gave his whole self. And we've looked at that. You know, when we, we, a few weeks ago, we talked about Jesus in the garden. Mentioned it tonight. But Jesus interacted with those around him in such a way that he was emotionally wound up with them. Relationally tied. You guys remember the shortest verse of the Bible? John eleven thirty five. 35. Who wants to quote that for me? Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Now, you got to think. The Son of God weeping. This isn't the single tear, stoic, knowing everything's going to be okay. This is emotional. This is snotty. These are tears Flowing, this is moaning, this is uncontrollable, weeping. Because his friend, who he dearly loved, was lying dead. Now, it turned to celebration when Jesus raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. But the disconnection in that moment welled up in the Son of God, and he wept. Jesus wept. Jesus saw people as worth being invested in, being real with. He didn't keep them at arm's length. He was not afraid to develop develop deep, heartfelt, intimate relationships. Do you see, friends, that we are invited to also do that? We don't have to stand at arm's length from those around us. Giving a, a perception that we have it all together, that we stand apart from everyone else. No, we can interact. We can weave our lives and the story of our life with the stories of other people's lives. C.S. Lewis, in writing in The Four Loves, he says, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one. Not even an an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. 
Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in a casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. To love is to be vulnerable. You see this, that Jesus risked vulnerability to the point that when Lazarus died, he wept. Friends, where are we keeping ourselves from connecting with vulnerability? This is the invitation to love like Jesus loved. Friends, what would it look like to simply lean into the love we've received in such a way that it moves us today and every day. To moves us to allow us to live life like Jesus as we love God and we love others. Again, the invitation is rooted in simply inviting us to love as we've been loved. It's this reciprocal action. And as we do so, as we love God and as we love others, our lives can become signposts to all who see it of a God who loves, of a God who's pursued. As we love in servanthood, as we love with sacrifice, and as we love with our true self, people see who Jesus is in us. Friends, the life of Christ unveils a distilled experience of love, the incarnation as love letter. It's love in the purest sense. And friends, as we lean into Christmas, it celebrates the kickstart of this love movement as God himself came in infant form. Church family, what would it be like to lean into God's love in such a way that we show God's love to a world that desperately needs even just a little bit more of it? Lord God, may we love with your type of love, a love that turns heads, a love that blows people's minds, a love that uh, makes people say, what is going on there? And may people find it compelling. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.